Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we'll be covering a wide range of breast cancer management this evening. And I'll start with breast cancer uh, genetics and uh, incidence as well as risk factors. And then subsequently, uh, each physician will carry on the management of the breast cancer surgery, radiation therapy, reconstructive surgery, chemotherapy, and all of that. So I'm Dr. Patel, I'm a medical oncologist. Uh, I'm a medical director for Cancer Service at Central Hospital. And uh, in the first slide, please. So breast cancer is uh, the prominent cancer. Uh, in female, it will be one in eight. In female will develop breast cancer in their lifetime. In estimated about 268,600 uh, new cases uh, in 2019. Uh, this is one of the most common cancers in the uh, USA, and the uh, uh, second leading cause of cancer related death in US women. I think it's the first leading cause of lung cancer, although um, breast cancer is more common, lung cancer is more lethal because it is generally detected a little bit more advanced infective infections, and while improving significantly is not still a better breast cancer management. The risk factors for the breast cancer, this is the main risk factor, is just having the presence of breast. When females have a uh, lifetime risk of developing breast cancer, and as one grows older, the risk goes up. Uh, personal history of breast cancer, then there is a risk for contralateral breast cancer, or becomes in the same breast, uh, continues to uh, be higher than uh, age match control. Females that do not have personal history of breast cancer. Family history of breast cancer also increases the risk. Certain non cancerous conditions, such as atypical pelvic hyperplasia, child chest radiation, patients who have received hormone replacement therapies, they, those patients who have higher risk for developing breast cancer. Uh, certain other risk factors are obesity, uh, especially after menopause, increases the risk for development of breast cancer as well as occurrence of breast cancer. So, uh, amount of alcohol that we drink increases the risk of the breast cancer. Patients who have used hormonal contraceptive therapy also have higher risk. So, dense breast tissue, maybe by itself, is not a higher risk, however, detection can be a problem, and therefore, uh, it is a higher risk uh, for the patients not having children before age 30. Uh, not having Breast fat the children increases the risk early in the and late menopause. Once again, prolonged exposure of estrogen uh, increases the risk. Uh, overall, patients who are developing breast cancer are very this question or oh, is this due to genetic mutation? However, sporadic cases in random cases much higher, and about 5 to 10 percent of breast cancer are inherited from. Uh, BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutations are the most common cause of hereditary breast cancer. So when you look at the general population, uh, the lifetime breast cancer risk is about 12% and median age is 62. The RCA1 patients have 65% of breast cancer risk in lifetime and the median age actually drops down to 43. Uh, some of us have seen patients as young as 25. So patients who have BRCA mutation are managed and followed very, very uh, differently. We are seeing two mutations patients also have a lifetime risk of developing breast cancer. It is level less than we are seeing one. Uh, and once again, the median age is in the early 40s. Uh, patients who are diagnosed to have breast cancer younger than 50, patients who have triple negative breast cancer that are younger than 60, are the ones that should be evaluated for genetic testing. Uh, Patients who have more than one uh, close relatives that are diagnosed with have breast cancer younger than 50, or any family members uh, who are diagnosed to have ovarian cancer, regardless of their age, should be evaluated for genetic testing. Male breast cancer, regardless of the age, whether they are 30 or they are 85, if there is a single male breast cancer in the family, then that family needs to be screened. Pancreatic cancer, pancreatic metastatic prostate cancer occurring in a younger age also increases the risk for uh, 
genetic mutation possibilities in the upper dose patients should be seen as well. Actually, the Jewish population have a higher risk of developing uh, breast cancer and also having higher risk of genetic mutations and should have comes to the end testing done. There are multiple genes as outlined in these slides that are detected via sites, BRCA1 and BRCA2, and are linked with breast cancer. And therefore, in the cases, they would not only do BRCA1 and BRCA2 genetic panel, but they would be doing the my risk panel, meaning wide genetic panel is being done. As I mentioned earlier, about 5 to 10 percent of breast cancers are hereditary. It can be inherited in an autosomal dominant or in a recessive manner. And each child, whether male or female, is at risk for inheriting that gene from either parent. And therefore, only maternal history is not important. History from father and mother's side is important to outline to your physicians so that they can then consider genetic counseling and testing for you as well as your family members. So some of the reasons to do genetic testing is that it really influences how you will manage the patient moving forward, meaning uh, are you, how are you going to evaluate this patient in terms of mammography or MRI or combination of both? Are you going to what kind of surgical management these patients would be offered if they have mutations, uh, etc. is very important. So genetic uh, testing definitely influences the management of the patient and even survivors if they have a risk for other cancers that could develop, and therefore it is important to uh, uh, figure out at the time of initial diagnosis that who will be in need for genetic counseling and testing, and once that information is available, would be helpful to managing all of the doctors that are managing the cancer of the breast, the medical oncologists, the surgeons, the plastic surgeons, the radiation oncology, and uh, ultimately it also helps in survivorship care plan. So as I had mentioned before, that random heat is much higher uh, in terms of developing breast and ovarian cancer. The hereditary syndrome of developing breast and ovarian cancer is overall much smaller when you take all comers who have breast or ovarian cancer. However, uh, the incidence is not small and therefore it should be uh, in the management changes. Therefore, any patient who, is, who has personal history of ovarian cancer or family history of ovarian cancer should have genetic counseling and testing done. And then I have already outlined before that in patients who are diagnosed to have breast cancer and what situation would trigger the genetic testing such as age younger than 50, uh, triple negative breast cancer younger than 60, uh, more than one uh, first degree relative with breast cancer and more than two with first degree relatives with breast cancer. Or if you are, there is no mutation in the family, then certainly it changes the whole uh, management, meaning you would then certainly consider that uh, as an upfront uh, evaluation. So once again, this uh, outlines the same thing that I just mentioned, uh, pancreatic cancer and known mutation in the family, male breast cancer, and uh, even fallopian tube cancer should be treated just like you would be treating ovarian cancer in terms of genetic uh, evaluation and uh, testing. BRCA1 and 2 genes are the commonest ones that uh, have been identified and uh, these mutations carry a 70-80% chance of developing breast cancer in their lifetime. More than 15% of women with ovarian cancer can have BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutation and 47% of the ovarian cancer patients when they are tested, uh, even if they did not have prior family history of malignancy, uh, BRCA uh, mutation should be done. 71% of the ovarian cancer patients with BRCA mutation are 50 and older. So age, meaning if my aunt had an ovarian cancer or my grandmother had an ovarian cancer at age 75, that does not mean it should be disregarded. Uh, BRCA mutation of 55% chance of developing ovarian cancer in BRCA1 mutation and in BRCA2 mutation there is 25% chance of developing ovarian cancer. So when you look at the probability of uh, uh, how often you will be able to find these mutations for male breast cancer is about 8%, 
breast cancer in younger than 40 is more than 10 percent ovarian cancer would be 10 to 15 percent breast and ovarian cancer both would significantly go up up to 86 percent and triple negative breast cancer who are younger than 60 would be about 10 to 25 percent so the benefits of genetics it really ends the uncertainty uh, and uh, clarifies the cancer risk of an individual uh, as well as for the family members uh, and uh, also it helps in decision making process how are you going to manage these patients uh, from surgical aspect as well as how are you going to manage these patients uh, subsequent to completion of their therapy in terms of survivorship care plan. Also, it relieves the anxiety of whether you have the mutation or not. The risk and limitation, any testing has its own limitation, and so negative test results does not mean one is, does not have any risk. It only means that now you fall into the general population risk. So there is, it is a, to some extent falsely reassuring, uh, however, everyone needs to know that negative test meaning, okay, you don't need a special uh, care in terms of screening, however, general screening that everyone else should have should continue. Some patients in fear of finding out the result uh, do not want genetic testing done, and that's why counseling is important. Sometimes there is family dynamics if you have four siblings and three are positive and one is not, there is kind of a reverse uh, rejection mechanism going on or guilt that happens. Uh, timing of testing is not optimal, uh, optimally identified. Uh, however, you should discuss with your physician uh, to uh, discuss further and concerns about genetic uh, counseling, testing and discrimination uh, should also be discussed with your genetic counselor. And uh, usual management for, is that, you know, for average risk person, just like any general population, awareness of breast tissue and clinical breast exam, as well as mammography, this will be addressed a little later uh, about screening uh, during this talk. Uh, however, average risk versus moderate risk versus higher risk, the breast cancer uh, uh, detection uh, as well as screening is uh, at a different level, and which will be addressed a little later by Dr. Ferenc. Uh, my name is Veronica Ferenc. I am a breast surgeon. So I'll be talking to you about screening, why we screen, and uh, the surgical management of breast cancer. So why do we screen? Uh, we screen because we found that breast cancer is found on screening are more likely to be smaller and confined to the breast. Uh, the size of breast cancer and how far it's spread are important factors affecting survival. Our goal with screening is to find breast cancer at the earliest possible stage. Uh, women should begin screening for breast cancer with mammograms annually at age 40. The screening strategy, however, should be ta tailored to each individual. Uh, breast cancer risk stratification can be uh, calculated by your physician, um, either your primary care physician or a gynecologist, to help determine uh, the appropriate intervals of screening and the appropriate screening tests that need to be uh, added into your screening. Screening mammograms are uh, x-rays of the breast. Uh, so the goal with screening mammography, again, is to find breast cancers at the earliest possible stage. Um, sometimes you may hear about 3D versus traditional mammograms. Really, the, the biggest benefit we see with 3D mammography is that there is uh, less need for additional views and additional images in women who have dense breast tissue. Um, women at, again, women at average risk should have annual screening mammograms um, and starting at age 40. However, women who are higher risk or with family history of younger individuals diagnosed with breast cancer may need to start screening earlier or with genetic mutations. 
Uh, some women who have a higher risk for developing breast cancer may have supplemental screenings in addition to mammogram and may have uh, more frequent than annual screenings performed. Uh, other indications for high risk screening in women uh, other than family history is again history of atypia on any prior biopsies. Uh, the long-term use of hormone replacements after menopause. Uh, and the important thing about mammograms is it's the only test that can see calcifications well. So sometimes calcifications are the earliest sign that there is a breast cancer present. Some calcifications are normal. However, if there are new calcifications, it needs to be evaluated. When we're looking at mammograms, uh, one thing that you may see in your mammogram letter is regarding the breast density. Breast density is not something that you can change by diet or any other factors. However, breast density is evaluated with each mammogram that you have. Uh, women who have higher breast density uh, which is composition C and composition D on the bottom two mammogram images, may benefit from supplemental ultrasound screening along with mammograms. Women who have composition A and composition B, which is the less dense breasts, may not need any supplemental screening. One of the ways we use uh, ultrasound is for supplemental screening in women with uh, very dense breasts, and that can be performed oftentimes at the same time that you get your mammogram. Breast MRI is another imaging modality that we use to evaluate the breast tissue. There are a few indications for MRIs uh, at any given time. In a woman who's diagnosed with breast cancer, this may be used to further evaluate the breast cancer and to further delineate the anatomy versus where the tumor is within the breast to help uh, plan for treatments. MRIs can also be used during high-risk screening for women who have a very high risk of developing a breast cancer. Uh, MRIs may supplement screening by alternating MRIs with mammograms every six months so that you're not going a, whole, a full year without a screening exam. Other reasons for MRI may be for further evaluation of symptoms such as bloody nipple discharge if there are no abnormalities found on other imaging modalities. So the letter that you receive after your screening mammogram uh, can be scary uh, because the verbiage that they use is a standard verbiage and it Radiologists, when they're reading mammograms, they read it on a scale. Over to the left of the scale, everything is normal. There's nothing that stands out. On the right of the scale, it looks like a cancer. So if it falls in between, if there's something that's there, but there are no suspicious features, you may need short-term follow-up imaging. Uh, but if there are any suspicious features at all, they would recommend a biopsy right away. But really the BIREDS three and four, which you see in the middle, those are the ones that fall to the middle of that scale. Um, oftentimes we just need additional information. So the best uh, way to approach it is to get any additional imaging that may be requested um, before jumping to conclusions uh, and we, can then have a conversation about what's going on with all the information. Okay, so uh, breast abnormalities that are looked for both in self-breast exams and clinical examinations by your physician are lumps in the breast, changes in the nipple or the areola, pulling in of the skin or the nipple, uh, dimpling in the skin, uh, nipple discharge, especially if it's bloody nipple discharge, uh, redness or rashes that don't respond to standard antibiotic or antifungal treatments, uh, and skin changes. Any of these symptoms that are found on uh, a, clinic, a 
self-breast examination should be brought up to your provider. And if a provider finds any of these on clinical breast examination, which is examination with either your primary care, your gynecologist, um, or any of your other providers, uh, then they would evaluate that further. So if there is a suspicious lump that you find on self-breast exam or if there are abnormal findings on imaging, what are the next steps? So typically we need more information first. So the first step often is diagnostic imaging or follow-up imaging. Sometimes there is a mammogram that needs to be done. Additional mammograms often need to be done. Uh, if uh, the radiologist is calling for more information radiographically. They may ask for an ultrasound or even an MRI in some situations. However, if there are any suspicious findings in those, in those cases where there are suspicious features on imaging or on examination, then a biopsy will need to be done. This is performed by a needle biopsy in order to take a sample of the tissue to look at under the microscope. And that's the way that we can diagnose what is going on. So what is breast cancer? Breast cancer is the abnormal growth of cells that can invade and potentially damage normal breast. Um, it can occur in any location of the breast. The two general uh, places or categories that arise in the breast is uh, ductal breast cancer and lobular breast cancer. Uh, the ductal breast cancers arise from the cells that carry the milk to the nipple. The lobular cancers arise from the cells that create the milk in the breast. This is a depiction of uh, abnormal cells and cancer cells. At the top of the screen, you can see a normal duct of the breast. Uh, the top circle, I don't know if, no pointer on here. Right? No, that's just a clicker. Sure. Just another slide, thanks. So I don't know, can you all see? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm not sure it's gonna go. Can you see the arrow from the mouse on the screen? Yes. Yes. So this picture uh, depicts a normal ductal arrangement of cells. The next picture going down shows some overgrowth of cells, which is a normal finding and very common. It's when these cells start looking abnormally shaped. Uh, is, this is still not a cancer. However, this is something that needs to be evaluated further. And if this is found on a biopsy, this should be surgically removed in some situations. There are a few situations where you would not. However, as we go further along, if you see there are more atypical cells here, this is considered a cancer. This is a non-invasive cancer, also known as ductal carcinoma in situ. And this cancer has not breached the border of the basement membrane. If we go one step further, this is DCIS with microinvasion, and you can see these cells have breached the border. Um, and an invasive ductal cancer, uh, there is gross involvement and uh, destruction of that border. So the difference between the stage zero ductal carcinoma in situ and invasive breast cancers is that there is a potential for invasive breast cancers to move into the lymph nodes into other parts of the body. And so that is a part of the diagnosis and evaluation during your cancer treatment. It also tailors the types of treatments that will be needed for the cancer. So how is stage determined? Uh, when a breast cancer is diagnosed, uh, stages go from stage zero to stage four. The stage of breast cancer is determined by the size of the cancer, whether or not there's lymph node involvement, uh, whether or not it has spread to other parts of the body. And it also takes into account 
specific characteristics of the cancer itself. So the biology is taken into account. There are receptors, uh, estrogen receptors and progesterone receptors. And there's a protein called HER2 that are evaluated. And we can get all of this information from the core needle biopsy that's done. Um, the grade is also taken into account when we stage breast cancers. Breast cancer staging is an estimate um, when we take these clinical factors into account. Uh, real staging is after surgery, if you have surgery first, because that will really give us a better evaluation of the lymph nodes and tumor size um, more accurately than the imaging uh, estimations. When we find early stage breast cancers, the survival is excellent. Um, stage one and two have up to 99 and 100% survival at five years um, more recently, whereas 30 years ago, the survival was much lower because we have better treatments, better screening, um, and overall women do better. So the treatment strategies uh, include local treatments and systemic treatments. The local treatments include surgery and radiation. And I say local treatments because surgery removes the cancer from the breast. Radiation decreases the risk of cancer coming back to the breast. And then there are systemic therapies, which include chemotherapy, anti-hormone therapy, immunotherapy, and targeted HER2 therapy. In terms of the surgery, there are two options for uh, the surgical treatment of breast cancer. One option is to remove just the cancer itself from the breast. The other option is to remove the whole breast. In some situations, women have the choice between one and another. In other situations, one may benefit over another. Uh, and this would be determined based on the individual cancer. However, with a mastectomy, uh, we are removing the whole breast. Uh, there are several different types of mastectomies that can be performed. A simple mastectomy is when we're removing the entire breast, including the skin, the nipple, and the areola. Uh, and the chest wall is flat after no reconstruction. Lymph nodes uh, typically will be removed with the mastectomy. Uh, typically, we'll do a sentinel lymph node biopsy, which is where we remove just a few of the lymph nodes, unless there is cancer in the lymph nodes. Uh, the second type is a skin sparing mastectomy, and this is typically used when a woman is getting reconstruction immediately. The nipple and the breast is removed, however, the skin over the breast is left in the body, and that is used to help with the reconstruction. With a nipple sparing mastectomy, uh, the breast is removed from under the skin and the nipple, uh, and the skin and nipple are left intact to uh, cover the reconstruction. A modified radical mastectomy is used in cases where there are, is a more advanced type of cancer, such as an inflammatory cancer, or if there is significant lymph node involvement and the lymph nodes need to be removed. A radical mastectomy is what used to be done. It's almost never performed anymore. This is removal of the entire breast, uh, the lymph nodes, and the underlying chest muscles. The other option of breast conservation, which is also called a lumpectomy or partial mastectomy, is removing a portion of the breast containing the tumor. Uh, with the goal being that the edges of what's being removed does not contain or does not have cancer at the edges. Uh, this is evaluated by both imaging during the surgery and by pathology under the microscope after surgery. Evaluation of the lymph nodes is also performed during the surgery in all invasive breast cancers and sometimes in non-invasive breast cancers if the whole breast is being removed. Uh, we try to avoid removal of all of the lymph nodes under the arm because the risk of arm swelling is a lot higher if you remove all of the lymph nodes from under the arm versus just removing the first few that drain the breast. 
and that's to evaluate whether or not there is cancer in the lymph nodes. Um, now, if a lumpectomy or a partial mastectomy is performed, this can be done with either oncoplastic closure or with an oncoplastic reduction mammoplasty. Um, so it depends on a lot of different factors that are taken into account regarding the cancer and the size of the breast as to which type of surgery would be best. Um, and at this point, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Lynette Skaya, who will be talking to you about reconstructive options. Hello, I'm Dr. Lynette Skaya. I'm a plastic and reconstructive surgeon here at um, St. Luke's Cornell Hospital. And I will um, discuss reconstruction options um, after a mastectomy or a lumpectomy. The goal of breast reconstruction is to restore one or both breasts to near normal shape, appearance, symmetry, and size following mastectomy or lumpectomy. The goal of breast reconstruction is to restore um, uh, the shape and appearance of the breast. Uh, breast reconstruction um, evolved in the last uh, 10 to 15 years. We can now reconstruct a breast that is almost as good as, as the natural breast. And we can do that with implants, with your own tissues, or with tissue rearrangement techniques. It is important to remember that it will not be exactly the same as the native breast. There might be different contour, volume, sensation, but the new shape and contour is still very attractive and appealing, and it still mimics um, a breast, what a breast should look like. Breast reconstruction can be performed in a couple of different settings. It can be performed immediately after the mastectomy or on a delayed basis after the mastectomy has been performed and treatments were completed. Decision is based on several factors uh, such as uh, the cancer itself or other treatments that are necessary. The breast surgeon and the plastic surgeon will work out the treatment plan as a team. A variety of options of reconstruction is, exist, and I will go over some of the more common options. The kind of reconstruction that you choose will develop on your body, will uh, depend on your body type, lifestyle factors, personal preferences, and procedural risks and benefits. Uh, the first one that I wanted to discuss is uh, breast reconstruction with implants. Uh, reconstruction using a breast implant, which is an elastic silicone sac that can be filled with saline solution or silicone gel. And um, since I'm a plastic surgeon, we'll go over some pictures. Um, so the first is a diagram of what a breast implant looks like. This particular breast implant is uh, placed behind the muscle. Um, as you can see that there is muscle and skin uh, covering the implant. And in the photographs, there are two photographs. There's one is the before photo and the second one is the after photo. And as you can see, the incision is made to the side of the nipple and areola, and that's the axis for the mastectomy as well as placement of the implant. And this particular patient had uh, what is called a nipple sparing mastectomy where um, the nipple areola are preserved uh, when the mastectomy is performed. Uh, next, um, we will discuss breast reconstruction with autologous flaps. What is autologous? Um, autologous means it comes from your own tissues. Um, so usually this, this, these tissues can be taken from your abdomen, back, or buttock. The first example is a, what's called a latissimus flap, and this soft tissue in a latissimus flap 
is taken from the back. And here's a uh, schematic uh, diagram of how this works. The tissue is taken from the back. It's passed uh, through a tunnel in the armpit and uh, moved over towards the breast. This is the diagram that I'm speaking about. Um, next is breast reconstruction utilizing abdominal based flaps. Um, in these cases, these are also autologous flaps and these tissues are taken from the lower abdominal skin and fat to create the breast shape. And um, there will be a scar from hip bone to hip bone and around the belly button as on this photo and diagram. Um, so the diagram represents um, an ellipse in the lower abdomen where this, the fat and skin will be taken from and brought over to the breast to reconstruct it. As you see in the photograph, the before photo, um, the, the, the left breast is absent and in the after photograph, the left breast has been reconstructed from the lower abdominal skin and fat tissues. And it's hard to see on this photograph, but um, the, the scar is right above the uh, uh, bikini line, as well as around the belly button. Uh, next, I'd like to discuss oncoplastic reconstruction. Dr. Franz um, mentioned that in her talk. Oncoplastic reconstruction is uh, usually performed in conjunction with a partial mastectomy. And the plastic surgeon utilizes the remaining breast tissue by rearranging it, similar to a breast reduction or breast lift. And the opposite breast can also be modified to create symmetry. And here's a schematic and a photo of that procedure. Uh, this procedure generally involves an incision around the areola, a vertical incision from the nipple to the lower fold, and another incision in the horizontal fold of the breast. And this would be a good option for patients who are candidates for breast conservation therapy, meaning a uh, lumpectomy, um, and also who are candidates for breast reduction or a breast lift. And that will conclude my part. And I'll end it over to our radiation oncology expert. Okay, so we've talked a little bit about um, surgical treatment options. So now we'll move on to um, some additional treatments that we typically do after surgery. So generally, um, we do radiation after surgery when patients have a partial mastectomy. We sometimes will do it after a mastectomy. And there's a couple of different ways that we can do radiation. Um, we can do radiation uh, via external radiation or we can do internal radiation. We can treat the whole breast or we can treat part of the breast. Um, most commonly, we use external radiation and we treat the whole breast. Um, and basically, what radiation is, it's a beam of intense energy, which we're using to kill the cancer cells. The type of radiation that we use is something called ionizing radiation. Um, and the radiation is produced in something called a linear accelerator, which basically accelerates electrons to produce x-rays. And um, that is what's used to treat the tumors. So I'm going to really talk a little bit specifically, get into details about what the radiation process is and, and kind of how the radiation process works. And, and there's a lot of steps when we, when we talk about radiation. And I'm going to kind of go through the steps. The first step is uh, the consultation. Um, and basically what, what the consultation is, is when you come and you meet with me, you meet with the radiation doctor, and uh, we discuss what the radiation plan will be. And at that point, we'll discuss what type of treatment you'll get, how many treatments you'll get, we talk about side effects, we talk about the process. So at that appointment, you really should have all your questions about radiation answered. 
And once we do that, then you come for the simulation. And basically what that is, it's the planning session. Some people call it the mapping. Um, and, and essentially it's a dress rehearsal for your treatment. So the way that we do a simulation is to do a CAT scan. And, and what we do with the CAT scan is we take a CAT scan picture of the area that we're treating, and we use those images from the CAT scan to plan out exactly the area that we're going to treat. And when we do radiation, we can position you in a couple of different ways. Um, either you can be positioned lying on your back, and you can see um, in this middle picture here, uh, the woman is lying on her back with her arms above her head. Um, and typically, we would put you in that position if we were treating your lymph nodes as well as your breast. The other option is to treat you lying on your belly. Um, and, and typically, we do that if we don't need to treat the lymph nodes. And there's a lot of advantages to treating people lying on their belly. So um, it's actually very similar to if you have an MRI. It's kind of um, a similar process. Um, and, and that bottom picture, the, the pink board, is actually what we use when we treat people lying on their belly. So you can see there's a hole. Um, and the patient would lie on their belly. And in this case, it would be the left breast, which would fall through that hole. Um, and, and the advantage of that is when we treat lying on the belly, the breast falls away from the body. And so a lot of the skin folds that are under the breast um, are kind of minimized, so there's less of a skin reaction. Um, and it also has the added advantage of allowing us to minimize the radiation to the heart, minimize the radiation to the lung. So if possible, we, we typically try to treat people lying on their belly. Okay, so we've done the planning session. We, we do the CAT scan, we get the images. Um, the patient will go home, and then the next step is to actually do the planning. Um, and so we take the images from the CAT scan and we import them into our treatment planning computer. And these are actually two images, the bottom two images are actually two of my uh, breast radiation plans. And, and basically what happens is on those images, I will draw out the area that I want to treat. So I'll draw out the breast, I will draw out the lymph nodes if we're treating the lymph nodes. And then we also draw out what we don't want to treat. So in this case, heart, lungs, um, and the opposite breasts uh, as well. And once, we, once I've drawn all that out, there's somebody called a dosimetrist. And, and essentially his job is to plan out exactly how the radiation is going to be delivered, exactly how we're going to arrange the radiation beams to hit those areas. And once he's made that plan, um, he'll present the plan to me and I can evaluate it. And, and you can see in these two bottom pictures, this is basically what it looks like when I evaluate a plan. So um, you can see on the, the upper right of those two pictures, um, there's a graph. And basically what the graph shows is the, the dose of radiation. Um, it's something called a DBH, a dose volume histogram. And essentially what it does is it maps the dose to the volume of what's, of what's receiving that dose of radiation. And so you can evaluate the dose that's going to the breast, going to the lymph nodes, and you can evaluate the dose that's going to the heart, to the lungs, and you can see if it looks like a good plan. Um, and then I can actually scroll through the images as well to look on each individual slice from that CAT scan and make sure everything looks okay. So once everything looks okay, once I've approved the plan, the next step is for the physicist to come and do some quality assurance tests. And anytime we treat anybody with radiation, very important that we do quality assurance tests to make sure that, that the plan is really delivering the radiation that we think it's delivering in a safe fashion. So once we've, we've approved the plan, once the physicist has checked it, then the patient will actually come and do their treatments. <clears throat> and this uh, on the upper left, that's actually a picture of our treatment machine in Cornwall. Um, we use something called a tomotherapy machine. And it's a little bit of a different radiation machine than some other radiation machines. Um, what's special about it is that it delivers radiation in a helical fashion, very similar to a CAT scan, um, where the radiation array actually will rotate around the patient in a circular fashion as the patient is on the treatment table and goes into the machine. Um, and so that's, that's our machine. Um, and, and basically when the patient comes for their treatment, we set them up in the same position that they were in when they came for the simulation. And we will take a CAT scan with them on this treatment table every day. And basically that's verifying that they're in the appropriate position. So that CAT scan is very important. And you can see the bottom left picture is actually what we get when we do that CAT scan. So the pink part of the image is the CAT scan image from the daily treatment. The gray part of the image is from the CAT scan from the planning session. And they're basically overlaid on top of each other and we can make sure that they're lining up. And if they're lining up, then everything looks good. The patient's in the appropriate position they go ahead and they get their treatment. If they don't line up, then we can make some tweaks. We can actually change some of the positioning on the, on the computer 
and it can actually change the position of the table to make sure that the patient's in the correct position. And then they'll actually get the treatment once we like it. Um, and so basically when we do radiation treatments, there's um, several different regimens that we can do with radiation. There's, there's kind of a shorter one and a longer one. So really the, the least number of treatments that we offer in Cornwall actually is 15, not 16. Um, and typically the most is, is 33. Um, in general, we try to do the shorter if we can. That, that's kind of the way that, that the field of radiation is going. We try to do shorter treatments if we can. Typically, when we treat the lymph nodes, we tend to do it uh, with longer treatments, although that may actually be changing a little bit too. And, and interestingly enough, actually COVID has played um, a little bit of a part in this um, with us trying to get patients through treatments a little bit more quickly. Um, and so we are kind of doing that even in people whose lymph nodes we're treating more often than we did prior to COVID. Um, so when patients come for treatment, typically treatment's about 10 to 15 minutes every day. Um, and then I see them weekly while they're getting treatments just to manage side effects. And, and when we talk about side effects, we talk about acute side effects and we talk about late side effects. And the acute side effects are really what we're managing during treatment. For breast cancer treatments, typically it's a skin reaction. People tend to get a mild skin reaction, um, some redness some dryness some irritation of the skin. Rarely, some people can get a little bit of a worse skin reaction with some skin peeling, but, but generally not. Um, and we have some creams and lotions that we use to manage um, those side effects if they happen. Um, so I get a lot of questions about radiation, um, and, and these are some of the common questions that I get asked. So one of them is, how do I decide the number of treatments that I'm going to use? So I kind of talked about that a little, but, but really the, the short answer is it's based on evidence. So there are clinical trials that have looked at the appropriate numbers of radiation treatments for different types of cancers. And it's actually fairly standardized from, from cancer to cancer. Um, and so really we use the evidence from the clinical trials to determine that. Um, no, you will not lose your hair from radiation. Um, you will not be sick from breast radiation and you will not be radioactive from external radiation. There are some types of radiation where you can be radioactive, generally not for breast cancer. And certainly when we do external radiation in Cornwall, um, you're not radioactive. Um, exercise is actually recommended, um, it's encouraged. Um, it's, it's very helpful, um, both for the fact that it can help you lose weight, which can actually decrease the chances of the cancer recurring. And it also can help combat some fatigue where some people experience during radiation. Um, there really are no dietary restrictions with breast cancer treatments, but there are some vitamins that we recommend avoiding. Typically any vitamins that are really high in antioxidants, we typically tell people not to take during the radiation treatments because they, they can actually um, negatively interact with radiation and kind of combat the way that radiation works in the body. Um, I'm just going to mention chemotherapy briefly because I'm a radiation oncologist, not a medical oncologist, but chemotherapy is, is also a very important treatment that we do for breast cancer. Um, not everyone needs chemotherapy. Typically, um, it's patients who have more advanced invasive breast cancers. Um, so if they have very large tumors or if they have multiple lymph nodes that are involved, um, then we'll use chemotherapy. Um, also for people who have um, different tumor biologies, so triple negative tumors or HER2 positive tumors, um, will often get chemotherapy. Um, and, and some people were not sure if they need chemotherapy or not, and so there are molecular tests, something called the oncotype test, which actually will take a piece of the cancer and send it off to the lab and can give you an individualized um, benefit of chemotherapy to your specific cancer, and so we will often use that to determine who needs chemotherapy or who would benefit from chemotherapy. Um, and there's a couple of different or, or several different types of chemotherapy regimens that we use. Um, and you can see them written here on the, on the right. Um, and then hormones are also very important. So anybody who has a hormone positive cancer, we typically recommend hormone therapy. And, and it's kind of actually a misnomer. We call it hormone therapy, but it's actually an anti-hormone therapy. Um, and it's very important because it will help decrease the risk of having the cancer recur in the breast that has already had the cancer, as well as developing any new cancers. And uh, there's two types of hormone therapy, something called tamoxifen, which we typically use in premenopausal women um, or in women who have DCIS. Um, and then aromatase inhibitors are used in postmenopausal women. And typically hormones are recommended for anywhere between five to 10 years. What's that? Oh, okay. Um, 
So follow up. So you've completed your treatment. You, you've completed your surgery. You've completed your radiation, your chemotherapy. Um, now what happens? So we will follow you up to make sure that the breast cancer has not come back. And, and there are several different parts of follow-up. So the first part of follow-up um, is to do a mammogram and or an ultrasound. Um, and, and typically they're done every six months to a year for the first two years and then every year thereafter. Clinical breast exams are also very important. Uh, typically the surgeon, the radiation oncologist, the medical oncologist will all do breast exams when they see you. So it's very important to continue to follow up with all of your doctors who are involved in your care. Um, this really is, is kind of the same thing. This is really more specific follow-up schedule that, that I typically use. So the last thing to talk about is survivorship. And survivorship is really important because women do really well with breast cancer. Survival rates have been increasing steadily over the past 20 years. And overall, about 90% of women will live five or more years after they're diagnosed. So it's really important to talk about survivorship. So what does it mean when I say survivorship? So basically, survivorship is the process of living with, through, and beyond cancer. By this definition, cancer survivorship begins at diagnosis, um, and it includes people who continue to have treatment, and it's going to help reduce the risk of recurrence and manage any chronic or metastatic disease. And there are several different phases of survivorship. There's the acute phase where you've just been diagnosed, and you're gathering information pertaining to the, the cancer and what the treatment should be. Um, and then there's the active treatment phase when you're actually getting all the treatments. And then finally, the long phase, which is the extended follow-up phase, which is when you're trying to get back to your normal life. So there are a lot of people who are involved in survivorship. So obviously the patient and their family are involved. All the doctors who are involved in the patient's breast cancer care. The primary care physician is actually a very important part of it. Uh, nurses, um, oncology navigation, psychosocial support, and then other clinicians who have been involved, the, the radiation therapists, pharmacy, palliative care, genetics, nutrition, uh, and physical therapy and rehab. And, and survivorship is important because it's really a lifelong thing. Because what we want to do is we want to make sure that you're being followed, and we want to make sure that we're going to prevent any new cancer from happening, any recurrent cancer from happening, or if it does, that we're going to pick it up by surveilling you and following you appropriately. It's also important because it really kind of takes into account the whole patient. Um, we're not only assessing to make sure that the cancer hasn't come back, but we're also making sure that you don't have any late effects, be they medical effects or psychosocial effects from the treatment. And if we do find that there, there have been some late effects from the treatment, we want to intervene, we want to take care of them, we want to deal with them. And the reason that I said the primary care physician is so important because oftentimes patients are really following up more closely with the primary care. And so we want them, you know, if they feel or they see that there's an issue, to make sure that they're involving the specialist and, and kind of getting the whole team involved. So um, there's, there's really a lot of components of survivorship. Um, but the most, the most important thing really is um, the care plan. So when you, when you finish your treatment, you're going to get a survivorship care plan. And basically what that is, it's a treatment summary. So it's a summary of the type of breast cancer you had, uh, the date that you were diagnosed, um, the information about what types of treatment you had. And it's really important because when you finish your treatment, you will get that, that piece of paper with all that information. And it's important for you to take that and to, to keep it. Because again, like I said before, you're gonna be living for a long time after breast cancer. And let's say your doctor retires. Let's say you move to a new state and you have a new doctor. It's really important for continuity of care that any new doctors that you go to know about what type of cancer you had, what types of treatment you had. It's, it's very important because, you know, oftentimes we'll see patients who had breast cancer 20 years ago, have a new breast cancer, and we don't know how they were treated because they really weren't doing the survivorship then. This is really kind of a new concept. And so it's really important when you get that information that you, that you keep it, you take it with you, and you have it for the future. There's other components of it besides the treatment summary. Um, it also talks about what the follow-up schedule should be. It will talk about um, what type of long-term effects you can potentially expect based on the specific treatment that you had. It will also have certain recommendations for diet, for exercise, smoking cessation, um, and it will also have some information about 
support. It will also have all the contact information for your doctors, um, as well you know, as, as anybody else who's been involved in the care. And generally, when you get the, the survivorship care plan, um, either the, the doctor or the oncology nav navigator will review it with you and, and go through everything about it in great detail with you.